extra special treat for giving the message. So let's make him feel, for the last time for a while, let's make him feel welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Well, thank you all. It's, it's, yeah, it's bittersweet. This is, as I've shared at the 945, this is my home. This is, I mean, I've never known any other church. This is, this is church to me. So, but I know I'm going to what the Lord has me to do, so I'm looking forward to that. And since it's my last Sunday, I figured I'd just start in the book of Genesis. We see how far we get, huh? <laughs> no, today's message is actually going to be about, it's a Hebrew phrase called Shavuot. And if it's unfamiliar to you, hopefully by the end it'll be pretty familiar to you, but it's, it's spelled, as it shows on the screen, S-H-A-V-U-O-T, and it's pronounced Shavuot. And this is one of the seven major feasts that the people of Israel has celebrated. We've been going over in Bible study, we went over all seven, but this feast, more than any other, speaks directly to the church. And this feast answers the question, why the church? What, what, what's this church about? And it answers the question of what God is doing with us. And it answers that question by first talking about why Israel and what was Israel's point. And so as we look today, we will see what church is about and why the church. So if we could all bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you week after week, day after day, Lord, grateful for who you are. Grateful for what you've called us to do, Lord, and who you have called us to be. And Lord, we pray we are faithful to that calling. We pray that we are faithful to your message. Lord, we thank you for how you have blessed us, and we pray a continued blessing. And Lord, we just I pray an anointing on myself as I give your word, Lord, and you just use me and just let me be a vessel for you and to get your message out today, Lord. And may your spirit settle upon each of us today and light a fire in our souls so that we may go out and witness for you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as I said, this feast is one of the seven major feasts. It's actually the fourth feast of the Hebrew calendar. It's in the month of Sivan, S-A-V, or S-I-V-A-N. It kind of correlates to our May-June month. And the Israel, they had, as I said, seven major feasts. Each feast was set up as a memorial for something the Lord did. It was to continually remind them, to call them back to what the Lord did in their life. And the feast of Shavuot, is actually in the New Testament, which we'll talk about, is called Pentecost, and so we'll be discussing that today. But this feast is all about what happened at Mount Sinai for the people of Israel. And Shavuot celebrates and is a memorial to two of the biggest times in history where God has shown up and he has established his people and he has established a covenant with people. And so Shavuot points us to where, when's the, when the Lord has shown up. For the people of Israel, this time for them is that Mount Sinai. They had just gotten done with the Red Sea. They crossed through the Red Sea. And then 50 day, well, 47 days later, they made it to the base of Mount Sinai. And then on the 50th day, the Lord showed up for the people of Israel. And he gave them something to do. He called for them to respond. The Lord showed in their lives and he called for a response. Just as when the Lord shows up in our life, he calls for man to respond. He calls for the church to respond. As it says in the book of Amos, Amos 3, verse 8, if you have your Bibles, in Amos 3, 8, we're looking for the Lord's, or our response to the Lord. It says, the lion has roared, so who is not frightened? The sovereign Lord has spoken, so who can refuse to proclaim his message? And so when the Lord shows up, he calls for our response. He calls for man's response. And specifically in this account of Mount Sinai, he calls for Israel's response. And then at Pentecost, he calls for the church's response. But as I said, this is this Shavuot. It's a, it's a festival celebrated year after year. But every time the festival is celebrated... It's just in a memorial to what the Lord did at the original Shavuot of Mount Sinai. So Mount Sinai is kind of the first Shavuot. And then what happens at Pentecost can kind of be considered the second or the last Shavuot. And then all the other celebrations, all the other feasts that happen year after year is a memorial so that the people of Israel and that the church will remember what happened at these Shavuot experiences. 
where the Lord showed up. And so first we begin with Israel and then we move to the church. But Israel's Shavuot experience, the first Shavuot, it's actually going to be in Exodus chapter 19. And this is, uh, as ironic as this sounds, this is actually Pastor Mix. It's his favorite Pentecost scripture. If you ask him, what's your favorite Pentecost scripture? He says Exodus 19, because that relates to our Pentecost. And we'll, we'll see how that relates. But in Exodus 19, the scene is Israel is just getting ready to meet the Lord at Mount Sinai. They had just crossed from the Red Sea 47 days ago. And they now are coming into this promised land. But before they come into the promised land, the Lord sets up kind of lays down the law. Literally, he gives them the law. And so he, set, and he sets them up as his people. And so for Israel, their Red, their Red Sea crossing experience is kind, of be, can, kind of relates to our baptism in a way. Because Israel, as they cross through the Red Sea, it symbolizes the fact that the, the death to their old selves, when they were slaves in Egypt, when they were slaves to Pharaoh, just as our baptism symbolizes the death to our sin, and then, as they cross through the other side of the Red Sea, it symbolizes their new life that they have in God Almighty, just as we have a new life in Christ Jesus. Amen. And so for them, they got this new life. They, they were living in this Egypt. They were living in Egypt under the slavery of sin, or under the slavery of Pharaoh, as we lived under the slavery of sin. And so they had this new life. They crossed through this Red Sea. They were ordained as God's people. Now they show up at Mount Sinai and the Lord's going to lay the terms down for his people. And he's going to give them a purpose. He's going to give them a purpose and he's going to give them a covenant. And so beginning in Exodus 19, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. After breaking camp at Raphaedim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and set up camp there at the base of Mount Sinai. Then Moses climbed to the top of the mountain to appear before the Lord. The Lord called to him from the mountain and said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you will obey me and keep my covenant... You will be my own special treasure from among all the people of the earth. For all the earth belongs to me, and you will be a kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. And so God is talking here. He talks to Moses, and he's showing Moses what he's going to do with Israel. And he starts by identifying himself. He says, remember, I'm the God that brought you out of Egypt. I'm the God that saved you from that life, from their slavery in Egypt. And throughout the Old Testament, one of the most common ways that God shows his attributes to Israel is he constantly comes back to the fact that I am the God who saved you from Egypt. I am the God who brought you out of Egypt. And there's a reason behind that. It's no accident. The, their slavery in Egypt was one of the most defining moments in Israel's history. Even to this day, when the young Jewish person is in school, if you were to ask them, what is the most defining moment in your history? They would automatically say, well, our slavery in Egypt was the most defining moment. And they don't even talk, they don't even say phrases like, when my ancestors was enslaved in Egypt, or when my forefathers were in Egypt. They talk as if it just presently happened. They go, my slavery in Egypt, our slavery in Egypt. They talk as a collective, not distancing themselves from it, but still, even to this day, showing how important, how much, how defining their slavery in Egypt was. And so for God, he continually defines himself as, I'm the God who brought you out of that. And for us, it's the same way. Our, their slavery in Egypt is likened to our slavery of sin. And so the God, God for us is the God who saved us from that life, is the God who continually says, I brought you out of that and gave you this new life. It's the starting point of that relationship with God. When he freed us from slavery. And so God says, Moses, I'm the one that brought you out of Egypt. I'm the one that brought you here. And he says, now I'm going to do something with your nation. Yeah. And so here at the first Shavuot, Mount Sinai, he establishes the Mosaic Covenant. This is a covenant that God made with Moses. 
And it, basically, the terms of this covenant were exactly spelled out here. And it says in verse 5, If you obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples of the earth. And so the terms of the covenant were pretty clear. They said, you obey me, I will be your God, you will be my people. And then the reverse was also true. If they forsook the covenant or they forsake the covenant, I mean, then they would be, then God would reject them. And God did throughout their history reject them. Never totally reject them because Israel always comes back. They're God's special treasure. Even to this day, they're not totally rejected. You read the book of Revelation, it's full of Israel. So they're still not, they're not totally rejected. But the term of the covenant was, on this day, if you follow my commands, you will be my people. And then as a sign of this covenant, at this first Shavuot, God gives them the law. In fact, the next several chapters, including chapter 20, talks about the Ten Commandments, is all about the law God is giving them. But God at this first Shavuot, remember Shavuot's all about God showing up. And so God at this first Shavuot lets Moses know, I'm going to show up. I will be there and the people will see me. And in fact, it says that in verse 9. If you go down to verse 9, and it's going to be 9 to 13. It says, the Lord says to Moses, I will come to you in a thick cloud. Moses, so that the people themselves can hear me and speak with you, can hear me when I speak with you. Then you will always, then they will always trust you. Moses told the Lord what the people had said, and the Lord said to Moses, go down and prepare the people for my arrival. Consecrate them today and tomorrow and have them wash their clothing. Be sure that they are ready on the third day. For the, that day the Lord will come down from Mount Sinai as the people watch. Mark off boundaries all around the mountain. Warn the people. Be careful. Do not go up to the mountain or even touch its boundary. Anyone who touches the mountain will certainly be put to death. No hand may touch the person or animal that crosses the boundary. Instead, stone them or shoot them with arrows. They must be put to death. However, when the ram horn sounds a long blast, then the people of Israel may go up to the mountain. And so God is saying, I'm coming down. And God is holy, as we know. So God is telling the people not to just nonchalantly approach God, not to just nonchalantly come up to God, but he sets up boundaries for them. He says, first, before you come to me, before I come down to you, wash yourself, consecrate yourself, Cleanse yourself from your defilement. And it's a great reminder of them, to the people of Israel, just who God is. You know, God, yes, a loving God. He's a God who understands us, but he's also a holy God. He's a God of holiness that just cannot be around sin, cannot put up with sin. And so in order for them to see them, he, they had to cleanse themselves. Just as we, to see God, have to be cleansed with the blood of Jesus. And so these people of Israel, they were to get ready. It took them two days to get ready. And then God said, on the third day, I will come down. And on the third day, this is when he will establish them as his own nation, his special possession. This is when he will give the law. This is when he will create the Mosaic covenant, the covenant that promises the people of Israel as long as they obey. Then they will get the promised land. Then they will be his own special people. And so the people of Israel cleanse themselves and then the Lord shows up on the third day. And he shows up in a powerful way. And so beginning in verse 16, let's read how the Lord shows up. And I want you to pay attention. There's going to be three signs for the Lord showing up. And we'll read them and I'll point them out. But I want you to pay attention for them. It says, on the morning on the th of the third day, so the people of Israel cleansed themselves for two days on the third day, there was a long, loud blast from the ram's horn. And all the people trembled. Moses led them out from the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. All of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in the form of fire. The smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from a brick kiln, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God thundered in his reply. The Lord came down on top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. 
And so Moses climbed the mountain. What a powerful picture of the coming of the Lord. And you catch the three things with the coming of the Lord. They had the ram's horn that was blown. The Lord descended his fire and there was a violent storm. Remember those three things. Those are going to come up again. So the ram's horn, the thunder, and the Lord descended as fire upon the mountain. And what a, what a humbling experience that would be. What a terrifying experience for the people of Israel. And they were probably all grateful that they weren't Moses, because after that scary experience, the Lord said, well, Moses, now you come up here. The people of Israel did not want any part of that. In fact, they were so awestruck. They were so, they were so scared that what they saw, that their response was not one of, yes, God is here. Their response was not one of, yes, Lord, we want to hear from you. They were so terrified that they no longer even wanted to, exp- wanted to talk directly to the Lord. And in fact, we see that if you just turn to chapter 20, just one page ahead. Beginning in verse 16, this is the people's response to that. It says, when the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn, and when they saw all the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance and trembled with fear. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but don't don't let God speak Don't let God speak to us or we will die. And Moses said, don't be afraid, Moses answered them, for God has come in this way to test you so that you will fear him and keep from sinning. So the people of Israel were terrified. This is what we call the fear of God. It's actually a perfect example of the fear of God. And it's not just a reverent fear. It's not just a respect for who God is, but they were trembling, it said. Trembling so much, in fact, that they said, we don't even want to hear from God directly. Moses, you speak to God, and, you'll, and he'll, you, then you can speak to us. We don't need God directly. Because they said, if we do, we'll die. And Moses said, don't fear. He says, God's, God's doing this to test you. He says, fear God and keep from sinning. And that's the whole point of that fear of God. It's not to get us to run away from God. It's not to get us to hide from God. This fear of God, not just a reverent fear, but a trembling fear for who he is, is to keep us from sinning. Because we have a picture of what happens to the sinner. Yes, God is a God of love, but God is a God of wrath who also demands justice and holiness. And so for the people of Israel, this was a, a not just a reverent fear, but a trembling fear. So much so that they were not wanting to speak to God directly. And then the people of Israel told Moses, said, whatever you say, we'll believe will do, will carry out, just don't let us talk to God directly. And so that, that's, how they, that's how they did it again. God spoke to Moses, and Moses spoke to the people of Israel. And so then God called Moses up to the mountain, and God started giving the law, the Ten Commandments, and all the law that's in the first five books of the Bible, God gave to Moses. He set up that Mosaic covenant with the people of Israel. And also the most important part that happened here is found in Chapter 19, back in verse 6. So if you turn just back, chapter 19, verse 6. This is, the, this is the key part of what God did for Israel on this day. So verse 6. He said, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. So on this day, on this Shavuot, the first Shavuot, They were to be God's witnesses. On this day, they were established as God's witnesses. And they were to witness to the pagan nations all around them. And so if you ever want to know why Israel, what's the point of Israel? They were God's witnesses. That's why if you read from the first five books, they had some pretty strange laws. Every one of those laws was to set them apart from the pagan nations around them. Because God knew the truth that you cannot witness to the nations around you, Israel, if you're exactly like the pagan nations around you, you have to be different from them. The same is true for us today. If we are to be an effective witness as a church, we cannot be like the world. We must be set apart. And so for Israel, God gave them all these laws and said this is because it sets you apart. And then they were to be God's witnesses to tell the rest of the world about him. Because most of the world at this time was a polytheistic pagan religion. 
And so they were to be, they, they had this covenant with God, and then they were to be witnesses to the other nations about this covenant, about who God is. That was their job. That was what God created them to do. And so he appears to them. So in this first Shavuot, God comes down. He meets the people of Israel. He establishes them as his witnesses. He sets up the Mosaic Covenant. And then the people in response were to witness. Well, unfortunately for Israel, this did not go real well. Because Moses went up to Mount Sinai. He was up there for 40 days and 40 nights to get the law. And the people of Israel became restless. Even though God had appeared to them and God told them, hey, you're my witnesses, follow my command, the people of Israel got restless. And their restlessness led to what we now call the golden calf of Exodus 32. So if you turn with me to Exodus 32. So right as they were established as God's witnesses on the same, the Shavuot experience, the people of Israel unfortunately didn't last too long before their time in Egypt crept back in, their old sinful life. If you ever wondered why they created a calf out of all animals, calf was a sacred animal in Egypt that was often worshipped. So that's, that's a little bit of Egypt still leaking in. Just as our old sinful lives come sometimes swell back up, well, they, theirs did too. And so they said in verse, 32, or verse 1 of chapter 32, it says, When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. They said, Come on, they said, Make us some gods who, we can, who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. They wanted a God. They wanted a God they could see. They wanted a God they could worship. They wanted a God they could party. They wanted a God they could sacrifice to. He said, we don't know what happened to Moses. We we don't know what happened to him up there. Make us this God. Now, Aaron's the high priest at the time. Aaron's the one that's set up. It's supposed to be in charge. A great response would have been, absolutely not. We worship the one and only God, but Aaron didn't do that. In fact, in verse 2, So Aaron said, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives, your sons, and daughters, and bring them to me. And all the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the the shape of a calf. And when the people saw it, they exclaimed, O Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So Aaron, not only did Aaron say, let's do it, but Aaron was the one who orchestrated it. Aaron was the one that said, I'll take your gold and I will mold it for you. You don't have to do it. You just worship it. I'll mold it. And then what what phrase could be more jarring to God than to have them point to this calf and say, these, these are the gods who brought you out of Egypt. When God instead says, I am the God who brought you out of Egypt. I'm the God that rescued you. And so right off the bat, they're not the best witnesses as of now. Because, and why aren't they the best witnesses? Because they so desire to be like everyone else. They desire to be like the nations around them. They desire to have a visible God that they could worship to, that they could worship and sacrifice to. And unfortunately for Israel, their decision has consequences. Because their their decision... It wrecked their purpose. Their purpose was to witness for the living God, not reject the living God to bow down to a golden calf. And so in verse 25 of chapter 32, we see what happens to them. And it says, Moses saw that Aaron had let the people get completely out of the control, much to the amusement of their enemies. So Moses saw that Aaron let the people get totally out of control. Aaron was the one set up to guide them. And in fact, Just a few verses up, Aaron actually lied to Moses because Aaron said, these people, they wanted it. I just threw the rings in the fire and then the shape of the calf came out. I didn't do anything else. When it says, at the beginning, it says, no, he molded it. So he was lying. He He was totally, totally failing as a high priest. And so Moses had to step up. And it says, so he stood at the entrance of the camp and shouted, all of you who are on the Lord's side, come here and join me. And so he tells the people, he announces to the people, choose now this sinful God, this golden calf, or the living God. Who will you follow? And only one tribe followed. 
And it says, and all the Levites gathered around him. So that was it. Only one tribe. And it says in verse 27, And Moses told them, This is what the, the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Each of you take your sword and go back and forth from one end of the camp to the other and kill everyone, even your brother, friends, and neighbors. And it says the Levites obeyed Moses' command and about 3,000 people died that day. Now when it says kill everyone, I, I do want you to know there was way more people in the camp of Israel this time than 3,000. You, you can just look at the genealogies back. What, what happened was is the, the Levites, they were told to go through and basically they were to randomly kill everyone that crossed their path until about 3,000 died that day. And remember that number, 3,000. 3,000 died that day because of their sin. That was the punishment for their sin. And the Levites were the only ones who obeyed. And because of this, we have verse 29. It says, Then Moses told the Levites, Today you have ordained yourself for the service of the Lord. For you have obeyed even though it meant killing your own sons and brothers. Today you have earned a blessing. And so if you ever wonder why out of all the tribes, Levites were the ones chosen to be priests, why were Levites the ones chosen to be at the tabernacle, it is because at the golden calf, only the Levites stood for God, Moses and the Levites. And so on this day, the Levites ordained themselves as priests of Israel. Now, again, all of Israel was ordained as witnesses, but the Levites were ordained to guide Israel, to be priests for Israel. And so the first Shavuot, not such a great experience for Israel. Yes, they are ordained as witnesses. Yes, God has given them the law. Yes, they have the Mosaic Covenant. But because of their failure to act as true witnesses, 3,000 lost their lives. And so each Shavuot after this, each year on the month of Sivan, the people of Israel celebrate this experience. They celebrate it to remind themselves of when God appeared to them and what God told them to do on this day, how God ordained them as witnesses. But we see from the Old Testament time and time again that Israel would fail in this witness. And you can't totally blame Israel. They, they were without the Holy Spirit. They, they had their sinful desires, as we do. But they continually failed, and they continually rejected God as their Savior. Now, there were times where they did. There were times where they did good witness for a while, but most of the time they continually faltered. And every time they faltered, it usually can be summed up to one sentence. They wanted to be like all the other nations around them. They were, not, they were not satisfied with being set apart. They were not satisfied with being witnesses. They wanted to be like everyone else. And so finally, at the last straw, God had to set Israel aside and come up with a new witness. Because Israel had rejected the Messiah, as we all know. They rejected Jesus as the Lord and Savior. And so they cannot be an effective witness to the world if they reject the good news. And so this, they set them aside, and as a final punishment, in A.D. 70, the Romans totally destroyed Jerusalem. They totally burnt Israel. Israel was sent all over the world. Now, it's important to note, God did not totally reject Israel. God set Israel aside. He set Israel aside because they could not be an effective witness. And so God needed a new witness, a witness for Christ, a witness to the world to tell of the good news that sins are forgiven, that death has been defeated, and that there is new life in Christ. Amen. And so God chose the day of Shavuot to ordain a new witness. Just as he ordained a witness at the first Shavuot, the second Shavuot would bring about a new witness. And as I said, Shavuot has been celebrated year after year after year. Finally, when Hellenization came to Israel, that's Greek culture, they changed the name of Shavuot. See, Shavuot just means weeks. That's the Hebrew word for weeks, and it's just to acknowledge that it's, it's 50 days after the first fruit celebration, which is the Red Sea. And then the Greeks changed the name from Shavuot to Pentecost. They began calling the festival Pentecost, which means 50 because it's 50 days after the Red Sea crossing. And of course, when we talk of Pentecost, that takes us to Acts 2, where God sets up his new witness. 
Again, not totally rejecting the witness of Israel, not totally rejecting his people Israel, but just setting them aside because they could not be his witness anymore. How could they tell of the good news if they don't believe in the good news? And so God set them aside, and on this Shavuot day, he creates a new witness. And it says in Acts 2.1, on the day of Pentecost, And this phrase is so important because it shows that this day was already famous before it became the birthday of the church. It says, on the day of Pentecost. So the church did not make this day famous. It has already been a day. The day of Shavuot. The day where the people come to the temple because it was a pilgrimage feast. So every devout Jewish person had to come to the temple to celebrate this feast. And it's a celebration of when God showed up and when God set up a covenant with Israel and ordained them as witnesses. And it was said in one book by an author that every year as the Jewish people celebrate this feast of Shavuot, their mind goes back to the Mount Sinai experience. And as they're thinking about the Mount Sinai experience, they wonder, will the Lord show up again as he showed up at the first Shavuot? Will he show up again? Each year desiring him to show up again. And on this day of Pentecost, the second Shavuot in history, God shows up again. And it says, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. And it says, suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. And then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. So on this day of Shavuot, the people are gathered together. And because it's Shavuot, and because we know the services at the temple, we can know that they were all gathered at the temple. I know it says, filled the house where they were sitting in verse 2, but the house is another phrase for the temple. It actually says in 2 Samuel 7, 5, it calls the house, it calls the temple of the Lord a house, where the Lord goes to David, are you the one to build a house for me? And so when you see house here, just know house is another term for the temple. The people of Israel were gathered at the temple as all devout Jews would have at this time. And so as they gathered, the Lord shows up. And he shows up in the exact same way he did at the first Shavuot, linking the two. The first Shavuot had a mighty storm. And it says in this Shavuot, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. So we got the wind. God descended on Mount Sinai like fire. And it says the Holy Spirit descended like flames or tongues of fire. So we have the fire. The only thing we're missing in this account is the ram's horn. But guess what? There's the ram's horn too. Because as it says in Acts 15, it says in Acts 15, these people are not drunk as some of you are assuming Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. Again, the, some of the people, they poo-pooed what Peter was saying, or they poo-pooed what the people were saying, because they're like, oh, he's just drunk, they're, they're not doing anything. But the Bible makes it very clear to say nine o'clock in the morning. And that's because at the temple, every day since the temple was established at nine o'clock in the morning, they have their morning sacrifice, right at nine o'clock, where they sacrifice a lamb. And they also do one in the evening, at 3 p.m. And every time they do the evening and morning sacrifice, they blow a shofar, which is the ram's horn. So here at the second Shavuot experience, we have the exact same God coming down in the exact same way as the first Shavuot. He descends as fire, just as he did on Mount Sinai. There was storms, just as there was at Mount Sinai. And there was a ram's horn, just as there was at Mount Sinai. And at this Shavuot, he establishes the new covenant, the one paid for by Christ's blood. The one that no longer is under the physical law, but the one where the law is written on the hearts of men because of the Holy Spirit. And a sign of this new covenant, a sign that this new covenant has been established is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so now God has created this new covenant. But he needs witnesses for this new covenant. And that is why it is called the birthday of the church. Because on this day, God has established the church as his witness for the new covenant. Just as Israel was a witness for the old covenant, the church, empowered by the Holy Spirit, 
is a witness for this new covenant. That is our mission. That is our purpose. That is the question to why church. What is, what is it? It is God's witness. I mean, don't get me wrong. Sunday morning is probably my favorite time. We get to worship together. We get to hear God's word. But church is much more than Sunday morning. Church is a witness to the world of every day, not just on Sunday. And we cannot shirk this responsibility because as the church, we are that witness. In fact, it says in Acts 1, 8, it actually talks about throughout the New Testament, you would be hard-pressed to find any book in the New Testament that does not talk about our witness. But I love Acts 1, 8 is one of my favorite places for it. And it says... But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is the Lord Jesus. says you get power when the Holy Spirit comes. And what are you to do with that power? It's not just worship. It's not just come to church. But it says, and you will be my witnesses. Telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So on this day of Pentecost, God establishes a new witness. The witness of the church. And praise God, we don't do it alone because it's the Holy Spirit witnessing through us. As it also says in Acts, don't worry about what you're going to say when the time comes, but the Holy Spirit will guide you. He will. And I've experienced that, and anyone who else has done witnessing has experienced that. The Holy Spirit takes over, and He does the work. And so we praise God that even though we are established as His witnesses, He goes right there with us through the Holy Spirit, guiding us in this witness. And this is, not a, this is not a responsibility that we can just shove off to the side. Because as God showed with his people Israel, if he needs to, he will set aside people to make room for other people who will be his witnesses. If God, said, if God was willing to set aside his own people for not witnessing, don't think God won't be willing to set aside people or even whole churches if they refuse to witness. Because what is the point then if they don't witness? God can't use them. And so this is a responsibility we must take. It actually should be a priority, not just when we get around to it, but our first priority, that every day we're going to go out of our way to witness. As it says in 1 Peter 3.15, 1 Peter 3.15, it says, instead you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And in fact, just above that is a, is a great verse that says, but even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry about their threats. Instead, worship Christ as Lord in your life. And if someone asks you about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. So that means at all times we are to be ready witnesses for the Lord. But just as a side note, you cannot wait for people to just come up and ask you. Yes, it will happen, but there will be some that won't ask you. And so don't, be, don't just wait for them. Be proactive witnesses, as the Bible calls us to be. But when they do ask you, always be ready to discuss it. Always be ready to share it. Always be ready to explain. And it says be ready to explain why you have that Christian hope. That means as Christians, we should have a hope no matter what. We should be different from the world. Nobody's going to ask us about our faith if we look exactly as the world does because they don't see any difference. But I can't tell you, and praise God, I can't tell you how many testimonies I've heard where they've said, I don't know what that person has, but I want it. That's the way we should live. In such a way where we don't even have to say words, though we do need to say words. We can't just do a silent witness. But in such a way where, we, where people say, I want what you have. I don't know what it is. Can you tell me what you have? And then we say, yes, I can tell you what I have. And then we point them to God. We point them to Christ. So we are to be his witnesses. I mean, that's the whole purpose the church is still here. That's the whole reason we're still here. If you're saved and you're still here, it means you've got some witnessing to do. Because the moment, the moment your witness is done, the moment that you've, you've reached the souls God's intended you to reach, he wants you home with him. I mean, that's, he, he loves you. He wants you right home with him. And we look forward to that day. But he leaves us here after we're saved so that we can bring others along with us. So that we can share it with others. And so just in closing, I want to just for a moment discuss probably one of the biggest reasons we don't witness. Fear. Fear that will be made fun of. 
fear that it's just not the right time, fear that we'll be called names, fear. And the Bible addresses this. In fact, 1 Peter addresses this. It says, don't worry about their threats. Instead, worship the Lord. And I also want to share with you, it's Psalms 118, verse 8. If you've ever been in membership class, you know this is the middle verse of the entire Bible. Psalms 118, verse 8. And it discusses this very matter of fear. And this translate the NLT is one of the more modern translations, so it says, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in people. But other translations, which I like better, say it is better to please the Lord than to please people. As the church, our goal is to not please man. Our goal is to not get compliments from men. Our goal is to please the Lord. Our goal is to witness, not because we want compliments from men, but because we want to please the Lord. We do not witness to get praises. We witness because there is a good news. We witness... Because we are saved and we want others to be saved. We witness because if God has grace for us, he has grace for everyone. And we witness because the Lord Almighty commands it. It's our job. It's our whole goal. And we take comfort in the fact that we don't witness alone, but the Holy Spirit witnesses in us. He's created this church just as he created Israel to get the good news out. I mean, if we don't do it, who will? If we don't share Christ, who will? It is our purpose. It is our goal. It should be our desire to witness. Because we do know that there is a hell and there is a heaven. And we do know that those who are unsaved, those that do not have Christ, don't have that hope. And we want them to have that hope. We want them to, especially our family and our loved ones, we want to bring them right along with us. And so our, our whole purpose as a church is to be a witness. And in fact, as great as it is, even though it's Christ witnessing in us and we're not doing really any of the work, God says he'll reward us for our witness. He will reward us for that witness. So we get, so the Christ does the work in us, but if we are faithful to it, we get rewards from our Heavenly Father. We get rewards from our Lord and Savior. But we have to be willing to to do the task. We cannot worry about fear or people's feelings when matters of eternity are at stake. Heck, if somebody's mad at you, they'll probably forget about it in no time. Eternity's forever. And I would rather have everybody on planet Earth be mad at me than to disappoint the Lord. And so I want to share with you today in closing, it's probably one of my favorite quotes from Charles Spurgeon, probably one of my favorite quotes ever. My mother will know this one. I've, I've shared it before with her. But it, it, it's just, th let this be your heart. Let this be your heart. It says, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with their arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. And if hell must be filled, let it be filled let, yeah, if hell must be filled, let it be filled with the teeth of our exertions. And let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. As I said, we know heaven and hell is a real place. And we know that those who go without the Lord Jesus only have one place. So let us take time each and every day to share the blessed hope, to share the gospel. Let us have the heart of Paul in Acts 20, verse 24. Probably one of my favorite scriptures. In fact, if you wanted to know a scripture that kind of sums up my call to ministry, I feel like it is this one. It's Acts 20, verse 24. But my life is worth nothing unless I use it to finish the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling the good news of the wonderful grace of God. Paul is saying the only thing that lasts, the only thing that matters is what we do for the Lord. And the only thing that will last is that. Not, not men's anger, not their feelings, not embarrassment, but what we do for the Lord. So let us use our time on this earth, this present church age, to witness. Because we know that the church is not always going to be here. We will be raptured out, hallelujah. And then after that, 
seven years of tribulation. And the fact that we're still here, the fact that God is holding off that tribulation means that there's still more people that need to be saved. There's still more people that need to hear that good news so they can avoid that tribulation and they can see the Lord and be His forever. So let us be the ones to tell them. We can't wait for somebody else to do it. God has called us. God has called the church to be His witnesses. Let us all bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we know that you have ordained us as witnesses, Lord. And even though we do not feel up to the task, Lord, we know that your Holy Spirit will guide us, that your Holy Spirit will empower our witness, that we do not go alone, Lord, but we go with you. And so I pray that we follow your leading. I pray that we are not ashamed of the gospel, Lord, for it is the good news of Christ Jesus. It is the news that death has been defeated and there is new life in Christ. Lord, and I pray that your spirit go out among each of us today, Lord, and empower our witness. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.